Our Old Testament lesson today comes from 2 Samuel, chapter 7, verses uh, 1 through 16 in the Brown Pew Bible. It's on page 219. 2 Samuel 7, beginning with verse 1. After the king was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, he said to Nathan the prophet, Here I am living in a palace of cedar, while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan replied to the king, Whatever you have in mind, go ahead and do it, for the Lord is with you. That night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, saying, Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt to this day. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling. Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now then, tell my servant David, This is what the Lord Almighty says. I took you from the pasture and from following the flock to be ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men of the earth, and I will provide a place for my people Israel, and will plant them so that they have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Wicked people will not oppress them anymore, as they did at the beginning, and have done ever since the time I appointed leaders over my people Israel. I will also give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, who will come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. But my love will never be taken away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Our gospel lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 21 through 40. It's on page 725 of the Brown Pew Bible. Please rise, if you're able, for the reading of the gospel. Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 21. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, and the, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. When the time of their purification, according to the law of Moses, had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord pair of doves, or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem named Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He had been waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory to your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophetess, Anna, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple but worshiped night and day, fasting and praying. 
Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town in Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. This ends the reading of the lessons. You may be seated. Has everybody been having a good Christmas? You can answer that one. You know, you don't have to sit there and it's not rhetorical. You know, it's still Christmas time. It's we're a little bit halfway through the 12 days of Christmas. They start contrary to what uh, advertisers on TV would tell you with their sales. They actually start on Christmas Day. And it's a time period between Christmas and Epiphany, which is January 6th, and we're, we're going to actually celebrate it next Sunday. And then there was a time in tradition that you got together when, you know, early Christians celebrated Easter. They didn't really celebrate Christmas. When they started celebrating Christmas, they would get together on Christmas and uh, share a meal and all that, but they didn't give presents out until Epiphany because the wise men brought presents, you see. So you tell your kids from now on that they can just wait till Epiphany and see what happens. They probably won't like that a whole lot. But hopefully you've been uh, having a good holiday, uh, if you can. Probably kick back watching your favorite Christmas movie, whether it's White Christmas, Home Alone, Die Hard, Lethal Weapon, Gremlins. Those are all Christmas movies, too. And, of course, on this day, New, uh, New Year's Eve, uh, has anybody made any New Year's resolutions? Do people still do that? No. People don't do that? Well, I kind of wonder why they don't. Uh, what is a resolution? A resolution is uh, a promise. It's a decision. It's a promise usually to do something, to stop doing something that may be bad for you or to start doing something that's good for you. Um, that's okay. Don't worry about it. Hopefully it'll go off at the right time. It'll be like a... Like a uh, well, it, it, it's the warning that you left it on. Oh, Hopefully it'll go and be like rim shot, you know, anytime I tell a joke, which won't be too much longer. Uh, if, if you've ever made one, do you stick to it very long? Do you think people stick to a New Year's resolution very long? Is that what the regretted gym membership is usually about? You know, it's, it's 30 days maybe. It usually helps if you tell someone about it. But yet it's, it's, just, a, it's, it's just a promise you make yourself. Now, as far as sticking to it, the Holy Family starts off our, our gospel today by sticking to it, to, their, uh, to what's required. Uh, Jesus is circumcised at eight days old. That's, that is the law. Uh, probably not in the temple. They probably came to wherever they were staying. They had someone come and do that there. That was very common because, you see, the other reason they went to the temple was two different reasons. You... Uh, they, they went there to present Jesus, but not, not to name him. They went to redeem him. Because the law states, their law stated that the firstborn have to be taken to the temple. Whatever opens the womb of life has to be taken to the temple and, and given to the temple. Now, people, especially sons, they were to be redeemed. Uh, you were to pay the temple a price that's about equal to what we would think would be two ounces of silver. And you would redeem unclean animals, like donkeys, horses, stuff like that. You'd have to take them, too, when they're a month old, around a month old. The clean animals, like uh, cows, sheep, goats, they kept them because they sacrificed them. Because it was the first fruits that you had, and that's what belongs to God. So Jesus was actually redeemed when he was an infant around this time. Mary had to go to give an offering for her purification because um, she would have to wait. When, when a woman would have a male child, they would have to wait seven days. The child gets circumcised on the eighth day. Then 33 days after that, she would go to the temple and give an offering supposedly of a lamb and for a purification and a dove for a sin offering. Or if you were poor, you would just give two doves or two pigeons. And it's, they obviously uh, didn't have the means of a lamb because they, they brought the two pigeons. Uh, of course, if it's a girl, you have to wait 66 days. You have to wait two weeks and then wait 66 days. 
Don't, 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 I'm not going to make a joke about that. Don't ask me why. If you want to look that up, that's in Leviticus chapter 12 at the very first of the chapter, if you'd like to look that up. Um, but really, uh, the thing to point out is, you know, Jesus was supposed to be redeemed in a month. She had to do her purification in about 40 days. But they're there doing them together. So it's interesting that they, they chose to do all that together. She would have to, to come into the temple to present them. She'd have to first get purified. What she would do is a priest would meet them before the courts, before she ever come in, because the thing about it is she's not allowed to touch anything holy you know, at the time. So they would give the offering. He would make the offering for them and uh, state that she is, she's been purified. Then they would come in to the temple to the courts, and they would present Jesus probably to a different priest and give the temple offering for him. And in the middle of this, you've got this man named Simeon. Simeon is, this is the only time he is mentioned in the scriptures, him and Anna, of course, and he is uh, often described as an elderly man. We don't really know how old he was. It doesn't say too much about him other than his name, except for the fact that he was filled with the Holy Spirit was upon him. A phrase that was usually used in the Old Testament for prophets and kings. Uh, but he was on him, and he was promised that he would see the face of the salvation of Israel. He would see the Lord's salvation before he would die. And you have to remember, they go into the temple court. The temple court was probably, you could put 30 football fields in the temple court. And they were not the only people there. Like I said, there's other things to be done. People that come to worship. People that come to redeem the, their firstborn animals or their, fir, or their firstborn children. They, they come there to do that. So in a crowded temple, he is led by the Spirit to go up to this family, this young woman, and take the child into his arms and bless him and to sing his wonderful song about him, the fourth song that's mentioned in the book of Luke, the fourth and final one. Uh, this goes a little bit farther than what was done. There was celebration when uh, John the Baptist was named. That's when uh, Zacharias gave his song. But this goes even farther to go even when Jesus was presented at the temple. And that wonderful song that he gives, he thanks God for, first of all, he thanks God for the promise that's been fulfilled to him. And then he describes Jesus uh, as God's salvation for all people. He doesn't say he's going to come and he's going to politically or militarily defeat the Romans or their oppressors. He says he's for all people, Gentiles as well as Jews. Of course, the Holy Family, they're, they're amazed at this, that he would say it's about his son. They've already been told about angels. They've had... Mary's had her cousin tell her about, about what's some of the things that might happen. Shepherds that they didn't even know came to him at night and told him what angels had told them related to him. But this time, the message gets even more personal. Simeon tells Mary of how Jesus' life and ministry are going to go. He will be opposed and that she will be deeply hurt, most likely by his, tri his rejection, his trial, and his crucifixion. And at the same moment, Anna, who's, uh, who's described as a prophetess, and you remember that all this starts at a time when there was a great silence, where the, the period between Malachi and Matthew, the 400 approximately year period, is when, when God, when prophets didn't write anything down or there were no discernible prophets. In the middle of this, God has been talking to individuals. He's not been idle in any way about what he has what he has uh, planned for them about the plan of salvation. And Anna, of course, listed as an elderly woman. Uh, there's a little, some scriptures are translated that she was 84 years old. Some say that she had been a widow for 84 years. She was elderly, but she stayed at the temple, which is very unusual for a woman to be at the temple. She was a, a true warrior in every way. She actively pursued God with fasting and prayer. She gives thanks God, and spoke about Jesus, about, about him as a child, not just to anybody that would hear, although I'm sure the people in the area hear, but to 
the ones uh, this message of hers was directed to people that also looked forward to the promised redemption of Israel. There were others that believed even then, that believed all the promises that were listed in, and gave in the Old Testament that God had given through the prophets and through others. Because all this bridged that 400-year gap between Malachi and Matthew. Even at this time when the prophets weren't writing, God was working in the hearts and souls of those who believed. And it's about promises that this is really about. Promises that Jesus would later expound on. Promises such as in uh, the book of John, just a few of them in there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, and whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. And this one he, he uh, told to, who was the teacher of the law at the time, Nicodemus. And to a woman at the well, he said, if you knew the gift of God, and who had asked you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give will become a spring of water welling up to eternal life. In other words, this is not just about your, your, uh, your soul after you die. It's about your soul right now. And later, at a time after Jesus is opposed and even hunted to some extent, what does he say to his disciples? Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. And trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you may also be where I am. And even after Jesus uh, ascended back to heaven, the apostles carry on uh, these promises, uh, staying to the people. Paul writes in Romans that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. It is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As the scripture says, anyone who trusts in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In Ephesians, he lays it out for us that there's nothing that we can do in this. It is all through God. For as by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. And not by works so that no one can boast. <coughs> and then when we had our confession today, our declaration of grace, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Yes, there are many, many promises. So what does, where does that leave us today? We talked about resolutions and promises, and that's a popular thing, I guess, sometimes. But the big problem is that I see uh, at times, and it's a similar that you find in many modern writings about Christianity, is that people seem to have the idea, whether they're believers or not, that they have to promise God that they'll be good. Well, that's just stupid. It's the whole point. You can't be good. There's nothing you can do. But people sometimes want to bargain with God. You know, they come to church, they think, well, I'll go to church, that'll save me. I can learn all about the Bible and be an expert in it, that'll save me. In the end, you're just a church going intellectual that's going straight to hell. No. God doesn't want your promises. He wants you to have faith in his promise and in his promise alone. Nothing of us can do it. Nothing of us is capable. Nothing from us is even worth his time or his endeavor except for the fact that he loves us and wants us to be with him even now. One commentary I kind of read, and I probably won't read it again because it's kind of weird. It, it describes Simeon and Anna as one-shot wonders. They're just in the Bible that one time, and that's boom, and that's it. 
I don't really think so. I think they were there for a big descriptive reason because they truly, truly believed in a promise that wasn't even fulfilled yet. But they would see it, it would be fulfilled, and it would be for everyone. So if you do want to make a resolution, a decision, a prom not really a promise, maybe we should rededicate ourselves in this coming year with faith to his promise and live our lives accordingly for everyone to see. Amen. We sing the sermon hymn.